When's the last time you ever heard a message on hell? Now, a great number of ministers don't even believe in hell anymore. Dr. Savage, a theologian, said, I wouldn't care if hell were written on every page of the Bible. I still wouldn't believe it. Now, most Christians believe there's a hell, but they really don't like to think much about it. They get edgy when they hear preaching about it, in fact, because uh, it seems so far away from this life of ease and prosperity we have for us going in America. And even sinners like to think they're going to heaven. They don't even think about hell. And the only reason people can be comfortable in their sin, they remove the thought of hell completely out of their thinking. Shorty, a uh, drug addict about this high, came to me once and said, Mr. Wilson, I dreamed I died and went to heaven. God found out I was a junkie, so he sent me to junkie heaven. He said, and when I got there, he said, I was sitting on a mountain of beautiful white powder, as far, a huge mountain of white heroin. And there were thousands of needles as far as your eye could see. And at the base of this mountain of heroin was an eternal lake of fire and water to cook this stuff with. And all through eternity, I shot heroin in my veins, and the pile never went down. He said, that's heaven, that's where I'm going. He doesn't even think, there's not a drug addict in the streets of New York or anywhere in the country that thinks so. One moment about hell, it's all, I'm going to heaven. One way or another, I'm going to make it. People no longer believe there's any wrath in God. Nowadays, God is all love. He's all sweet, easy going. He's never going to cause anybody to suffer. He'll ne never let anybody be tormented. And that's because this generation has lost its fear of God. Jeremiah the prophet cried out, You have forsaken the Lord your God because the fear of the Lord is not in you now. Isaiah cried, Why are your hearts hardened to the fear of God? You sin because your hearts are hard to the fear of God. The psalmist is even more to the point. He said, sin lurks deep in the hearts of the wicked, forever urging them on to evil deeds. They have no fear of God to hold them back. They have no fear of God to hold them back. Psalms 36, 1. They have no fear of God to keep them back from their sinning. Now let me show you what happens when a generation loses its fear of God. The results are terrifying. Our organization sponsors a program called Youth Research Foundation, coast-to-coast -coast program, and we've just completed a one-year research study program from coast-to-coast, -coast, 42 states. This included young people and uh, college students, teenagers, rich and poor, urban rural, every economic social group. And get ready now to be shocked. Now, folks, uh, Gallup poll uses 1,200 people. We use 3,000 in every one of our surveys. And if we multiplied it and did 50,000, the results would be the same, the percentages. Now listen to this. 84% of the young people are drinking. 84%. 52.7 smoke. 52.2 use drugs. 66%, two-thirds of all the young people interviewed said they'd rather live together without a marriage license than get married. They just live together, cohabitate. Now, here's the shocker. This blows my mind. Of all the kids in 3,000 that we interviewed, coast to coast, 42 states, of all those who confess they're using drugs, sex, alcohol, drinking, and into the occult, 82% claim to be born-again Christians. Now, let me read to you word for word. Here's a 15-year-old boy from Mississippi. Uses drugs, smokes, drinks, has anything go sex. I quote him. Being born again is the ultimate experience in my life. Christ is my Savior and Lord. 19-year-old girl from Fort Worth, Texas. Smokes, drinks, uses drugs, anything go sex. I'm thankful Jesus died for me and saved me from hell. 19-year-old boy from Fort Lauderdale. Smokes, drinks, uses drugs, involved in sex. In fact, he said the most three important things in his life are women, sex, and money. What about Jesus? 
Jesus saved me from hell. Here's a young homosexual from Fort Lauderdale. Drinks, uses drugs, homosexuality. Jesus is my very loving Savior. 16-year-old girl from Mississippi. She's into the occult. She smokes, drinks, and uses drugs. Jesus is neat. I wish he were here right now. I'd like to talk to him. 19-year-old girl from South Dakota. Smokes, drinks, uses drugs. I attend an Assembly of God church. I speak with tongues. Going to heaven is the most important thing in my whole life. Smokes, drinks, uses drugs. Young boy, young man from Hollywood, Florida. Sex, drugs, drinks, smokes. God talks to me every day. I love him dearly. 17-year-old boy from Oklahoma. Smokes, drinks, uses drugs, anything goes sex. I can't wait for Jesus to come. I want to meet him. Folks, what's happening in America? After a so-called 10-year outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon all flesh, from the youth revivals and then a charismatic renewal, the Bible says they have no fear of God to hold them back. This generation's lost its fear of God. This nation's going mad because people no longer believe there's a payday. 17-year-old boy said, why not live it up? When you die, you just die. You float off into a world of colors and rest and peace. Our young people today are convinced that the judge has gone soft. There's no more sentencing, no more prisons, no more judgment day. Now, they don't say sin pays. They just say it doesn't cost you anything. It doesn't hurt you. Who's responsible for this madness? Who is it that's robbing this generation of the fear of God? Who is it that's taking them down the road to hell? I accuse here and now the backslidden, unbelieving preachers of the gospel, those who've lost their faith, but who still continue to preach the gospel behind the sacred desk. Now, folks, listen, I'm not, I haven't even started yet. I want... I may never get invited back here, but I'm going to load my guns good right now. Let me, hold it just a minute. I, I am not one of those evangelists who goes around spanking preachers. They get enough from their deacon boards. I, I don't believe in that. And we've got some godly preachers in this place. There are a lot of godly ministers in this town, great men of God. But there are a lot of reprobated wolves in sheep clothing in this town and every town. And these preachers who've lost their faith are sending more kids to hell than all the drug pushers and com pornographers combined. Jeremiah the prophet was heartbroken over the false preachers of his time. He said, My heart within me is broken because of these men. My bones shake. I stagger like a drunken man. I've seen in the prophets of Jerusalem a horrible thing. These men commit adultery. They walk in their own lies. And they strengthen the hands of the evildoers. So sinners will not stop their wickedness. They are unto me as Sodom and Gomorrah. These backslidden priests and prophets of Jerusalem had encouraged people in their sins. Why? Because there was sin in their own heart. You show me a preacher who stands up and winks at sin. He's trying to excuse something in his own life. Jeremiah scathed them with his holy anger. Thus saith the Lord, hearken not to the words of these prophets. They make you proud. They don't speak for the Lord. They speak out of their own hearts. Jeremiah was saying, wicked preachers produce wicked parishioners. Wicked preachers produce wicked people. Yea, they are prophets of the deceit of their own heart. They cause my people to forget my name. They steal their messages from each other. I've not sent these prophets. I've not spoken to them, yet they continue to preach. Jeremiah 23, 21 to 27. Come on, folks. What's behind all this? Not the pushers, not the pornographers, not the massage parlors, not dirty television. They are encouraged by godless preachers. They say unto them that despise me, Don't worry, all is well. And to those who live any way they want to, Be at peace, no evil shall come upon you. Isn't that what people want to hear now? 
Isn't that why they flock to hear preachers of happiness messages and simple positive preaching? Just be at peace. Just think right. There's no hell. Everything's okay. In other words, do what you please. Live it up. Have fun. God is good. Don't worry about hell. You can have happiness. Live as you please. Now, how can you tell whether a man behind the pulpit's a man of God or a man of the devil? What's the test of a false prophet and a true man of God? A true man of God has the fear of the Lord in him, and he turns people away from their sins. Do you believe that? Test him. Is he preaching a gospel designed to turn men's hearts away from sin? Listen to the Bible. If they were mine, saith the Lord, they would try to turn my people away from their evil ways. Jeremiah 23, 22. If they were mine, if they were my preachers, saith the Lord, they would try to turn my people away from their evil ways. There's the test. A true man of God doesn't use lightness in the pulpit. He's not a joker who can laugh when people are dying and going to hell. Jeremiah said of them, they cause my people to err by their lies and by their lightness. Their lightness. They have nothing at all to say to my people. You show me a Bob Hope in the pulpit, and I'll show you a man who's damning people to hell. A preacher who preaches nothing but comedy and happiness has never turned anybody away from their sin. Thank God the Holy Spirit's raising up holy men all over the country. I see this now happening. More and more ministers are weeping between the porch and the altar. More and more men are laying down their golf clubs. More, I'm not against that either, but once when the world is dying and going to hell, we have got to have men who come in Sunday morning having been half the night, if necessary, on their knees, and come into the pulpit Sunday morning and say, Thus saith the Lord, and the whole audience knows it. You can hardly find a church anymore. Oh, thank God there are some. You can hardly find a church anymore where you can sense the power of conviction, where men are convicted of their sin, rather than lulled to sleep in their iniquity. But even in evangelical circles now, too many ministers are growing cold. They're compromising, and they're actually encouraging people in their sin. I wrote a book, for example, called Sipping Saints. I struck out at people who think they can talk in tongues and drink scotch and speak in pickled tongues. I don't believe in that. Now, I have a charismatic experience. Now, I don't like the word charismatic. It sounds almost like asthmatic or something, like a disease. But I, I have this experience, and it's, it's a beautiful devotional experience with me. But I want to tell you something, folks. If you're going to boast that you have given your tongue to be baptized the Holy Ghost, you better not be soaking it and smoking it. I, I, wrote a, I wrote a book called Sipping Saints. You know who wrote me the most criticizing letters? One, ten pages of criticism? Preachers. I got more bad press, more bad letters from preachers than all the prisoners combined. Brother Dave is a legalistic, uh, fundamentalist do-gooder. Stick to drugs. Well, what do you think that is? That's not a liquid pot anyhow. Who's leading the parade now in America to accept homosexuals? Who is it? Who is it that suggests homosexuals should be proud of what they are? Who is it that says, let's ordain them? Preachers. Ministers. Who is it that's flying now to the Arab lands and hugging Yasser Arafat? The killer of Jews? Who is it? Preachers. My brother, sister, these are wolves in sheep's clothing. They don't know their Bible.
I believe there's going to be a reserve section in hell for the faithless, evil-minded ministers who have helped damn this generation. Don't tell me how hot hell's going to be for rapists and homosexuals and alcoholics and drug addicts. It's going to be far more hot for those who have led people astray. You think of Hitler killing all those Jews, but then you think of a minister standing in the pulpit and con never condemning people to their sins, standing up there, lulling people to sleep, playing the flute while they're floating their way to hell. There's a reserve section. Better a millstone were hung around his neck and cast into hell than that he should offend one of these little ones. Now, I hear a lot of you parents out there saying, Amen, Brother Dave, give it to those preachers. Well, I got something for you. <laughs> parents are just as guilty as backslidden preachers for sending this generation to hell. Have you ever heard parents say, our kids went wrong when they took the prayers out of the schools. Our schools are too soft. They don't discipline our kids. They get away with murder now. They have no respect. The teachers are at fault. My kid went bad, but I've got three other good kids who just had a rotten apple in the barrel, that's all. This one was a bad, basically bad kid. He was led away by his evil friends. His friends did it. The school did it. Listen to what the Bible says. Prepare slaughter for the children because of the iniquity of their fathers. Why this slaughter? Because of the iniquity of their fathers. Isaiah 14, 21. Why are young people being destroyed by drugs and alcohol and sex? Because of the iniquities of their dads and their mothers. Children of the ungodly are always worse than their parents. Your fathers have forsaken me, Jeremiah said, and have not kept my law, speaking for God, but you, speaking to the children, but you have done worse than your fathers, each of you walking after the imagination of your own heart, and you will not listen to me now. You're doing worse than your fathers. When God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses, he said, speak to the people these words, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, bringing down the sins of the fathers unto the children all the way to the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. But I'll show mercy to the thousands who love me. But I will bring the sins of the fathers down on their children to the third and the fourth generation. Folks, right now we are facing the godlessness of two generations gone by. We are paying the price. Right now, Jesus taught that the wicked children are simply carrying out the tradition of their fathers, a tradition of wickedness, snakes, sons of vipers, not vipers, sons of vipers. How shall you escape the damnation of hell, you sons of wicked men? You're following in your father's steps. You fill up the measure of their wicked ways. You're filling up the measure. Know oh, how Jesus pinpoints our problems today. Your kids are finishing what your parents started. Cursing, drinking, cheating, adulterous parents have caused this wave in America of immorality. Now, the preachers and the false prophets encourage the kids in their sin, but dad and mom start them in it. I think I know what torment wicked parents are going to face in hell. They're going to have to have an eternity They're facing those kids in that same hell, tormenting and hounding them all through eternity. Now, this generation is resisting the Holy Ghost. They're getting hard-hearted because their parents taught them disrespect for the things of God. Stephen cried out, you stiff-necked and hard of heart. You do always resist the Holy Ghost because your fathers did, so do you. Your fathers resisted the Holy Ghost, so do you. You follow right in your father's footsteps. In fact, Stephen was killed by a mob of children, a mob of children. Now, they were adults, but they were the children of people who had resisted the Holy One, the Scripture says. And you resist God just like your fathers did. He said that to the crowd that was stoning him. 
You resist God just like your fathers did. You're just like your dad. You're just like your mother. Folks, you think about what's happening to our young people in America today. I shudder. I get a chill down my spine when I think what's going to happen 10 years from now if Jesus tarries. I shudder to think what's going to happen when we pay for 50% of the marriages ending in divorce now. 10 million kids living in broken homes right now. Folks, what, what's going to happen when we have 74% of the adult population drinking now and hanging out at all of these uh, happiness hours now from 4 to 6 o'clock with, with their girlfriends and all the cheating and all the fornicating and all the cursing and all the Christ denying? What happens 10 years down the road now if the children are worse than their parents? If it's this bad now, what's happening 10 years from now? Parents who were prayerless, addicted to television, cheating, scrambling for success, wallowing in materialism, forgetting God, forsaking the house of God, burdened down with depression and fear, drinking and cursing and self-centered. Is that why Jesus said there's going to be a falling away? Now, there's one more enemy that's dragging this generation down the road to hell. One more enemy. At first, when I was praying over this message, I was going to say, wicked companions, evil friends, preachers that are ungodly, parents that are wicked, and friends that are wicked. After all, isn't that what you hear around the country now? Isn't that what you hear from sinners? In fact, for years I've been preaching, stay away from the crowd. Don't let your friends drag you down. I'm not going to preach that tonight. I'm not preaching that anymore at all. I'll never preach that again in my life because the Lord showed me something. The crowd doesn't make anybody bad. Your friends don't mess you up. Your friends don't turn you on to drugs. They don't turn you on to drink. Not at all. You were rebelling against God before you ever moved in with that crowd. They didn't put the desire to sin in you. You got that all on your own. The crowd just brought out of you what was already in you. They just helped you be yourself. That's all. I had a teenager come to me and said, Brother Dave, you don't know. You're from a different generation. You don't know how hard it is to stay away from the crowd nowadays. I said, honey, you don't know your Bible at all. You don't stay away from the crowd. The Bible said you let your light shine for Jesus and they'll do the job for you. They will separate you from their company. You don't have to fight the crowd. Everybody, all these uh, secret believing young people, scared to take a stand for Christ. You know what I believe? I don't believe in secret beliefs. I believe young people that have enough Jesus in the say, make room of Christians coming down the hall. You yourself must first become an enemy to God before you can become a friend of the world. First thing, an enemy to God then a friend to the world. He that is a friend to the world is an enemy to God. How does it start? An enemy to God makes you a friend of the world. Ungodly friends, all ungodly friends have one thing in common. They have all turned away from the gospel. They've all rejected Jesus. Now that's illustrated clearly in the Bible between the friendship of Herod and Pilate. Now, here were two leaders, two government men, who weren't even talking to each other. They were bitter enemies. But suddenly, they find themselves with one thing in common, the man Jesus. Herod and his soldiers mocked Jesus. They ridiculed him. Then they dressed him in a gorgeous royal robe, sent him back to Pilate's hall. And listen to this. And that same day, Pilate and Herod were made friends, for before that they were angry with each other. 
What made Pilate and Herod, these two wicked men, friends? They had one thing in common. They were both lined up on the opposite side of Jesus. Their mutual rejection of the claims of Christ made them friends. Pilate needed Herod now, and Herod needed Pilate, because they both knew he was the Son of God. They had heard him teach. They knew that they should fall down and worship him. They knew it, but they rejected him, backed off. Now, Herod knew in his heart he was wrong. Pilate knew it, but he heard that Pilate turned him down. Herod heard that uh, Pilate heard that Herod had turned him down, and they got together and comforted each other in their rejection. What made them friends? Their mutual rejection of Jesus Christ. And the only way you can be in the crowd, the only way is to have rejected all the claims of Jesus before you ever got there. If you've got eyes of lust, you'll run around with an adulterating crowd. Adulterers. You'll run around with kids who lay around in the back of vans, making out and going all the way in sex at drive-in theaters. You don't go out and somebody takes advantage of you. Don't believe that. You had that in your heart, and your friends mirror what's in your own heart. Your friends aren't dragging you down. You're dragging down as many as they are. You're in it just as deep as they are. They didn't make you sin. They didn't drag you down. No more talking to me about how the gang dropped me down. I wasn't going to do it, but they forced me. I did what everybody's doing. Everybody going to party, so I go to party. Everybody's smoking pot, so I smoke pot. No, you drink not because you're trying to be sociable. You drink because you like the taste. You like it just like the rest of the crowd. You're with the party crowd because you're a party person. Did you hear that? Let me run that by slow. You're a party goer because you're a party person, that's all. I can tell what you are by the friends you run with. You tell me that, like these kids, I can drink, I can smoke, I can curse, I can have sex, I can use drugs, and still be a disciple of Jesus Christ? That's not what my Bible says, buddy. It says, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he'll hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in the world at the same time. And my friends, the day is coming soon that I believe the next move of the Holy Ghost is going to be a clean-up campaign in the house of God. And all these Hollywood celebrities that are in a Jesus Club one night and a Hollywood or a Las Vegas Club the next night are going to be purged. If they're sincere, they're going to fall on their knees, even if it costs them their reputation and their jobs and their money and their houses and their lands. I was taught when you come to Christ, you gave up the world. I wish I didn't scream so loud, but I get the feeling it's so strong. The path ends in hell. Now, no one simply dies. It's appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. Now, folks, I'm going to share with you tonight my concept of hell. I didn't get it from a book. I want the Holy Spirit to make hell so vivid tonight, nobody in this building will ever forget it. First of all, let me say that hell was not made for people. Bible said hell was prepared for the devil and his angels, and that's all. God said I, he wasn't willing that any should perish and die and go to hell. Not one person. In fact, you can't get to hell until you claw your way there. You have to fight through the Holy Ghost, the Word of God, preaching like this, and all your praying friends. You have to want hell awful bad to get it. Hell was not made for people. And that's why some of these theologians say, how can you reconcile a hell where people are tormented with the love of God? How can God torment people through an eternity? 
Well, folks, they don't understand that God didn't make hell for people. He made it for the devil and his angels. Now, hell is the furthest point you can reach away from God's presence. So when people tell me that hell may be in the pit of the earth, I have problems with that. Now, I don't know where it is. It could be what I call a furnace planet. If it's a furnace of fire, it could be a furnace planet because already we know that some of the planets are on fire. It's very easy to see the Lord said outer darkness. There's a passage that leads to hell called outer darkness. It's the end of this passage. You know what the devil represents? The furthest point away from God that a soul can reach. Here is God. The furthest you can get from God at the end of that outer darkness is Satan himself. That's hell. Now, God could have easily created a planet called hell and flung it to the outer reaches of the dark universe and reserved it for the hour of the damned. I don't know. But I've often wondered in my study of the Scripture why at the great white throne judgment the angel of the Lord binds the sinner hands and feet just before they're cast into darkness, into outer darkness. The angel of the Lord shall bind them hand and foot and cast them into outer darkness. I said, Lord, why? Why are they bound up? Isn't it enough they're going to hell? Why bound? Now I know it for the same reason that some unscrupulous businessmen went into the heart of Africa and brought blacks into America and put them on the auction block, bound hand and foot, and sold as what? Slaves. Slaves. All the devil's slaves are bound by chains, and God even delivered the fallen angels to hell in chains. God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them in chains to darkness to be reserved unto judgment. He delivered the angels in chains. There is no freedom in hell. They are bound because that signifies to God, I am delivering you, your slave. This is your property. This is your slave. I deliver him bound to you. You bound him. Here he is, bound. Every sinner is going to be delivered to hell, delivered as a slave, bound in chains. God's chains. And the devil can't loose those chains. In fact, the devil's going to be bound for a thousand years himself by the angel of God. Here it is very clearly in the Scripture. They are going to be bound hand and foot. I don't have that scripture with me, but there's a scripture in the Bible that says the angel of the Lord will go take Satan and throw him in the pit and bind him hand and foot for a thousand years. Now, hell is described in the Bible like this, a bottomless pit, a lake of fire, a furnace of fire, a place of torment, a place where sinners weep and wail and gnash their teeth. Now, is there really literally a lake of fire like hot lava that spews out of a volcano? Is there really brimstone in hell? Or is the fire of hell something supernatural, a kind of fire that our minds can't even comprehend, something millions of times hotter? First of all, folks, I wish you would get out of your mind Dante's Inferno and the concept of hell as being some place where there's just uh, the fire, the kind of fire we picture coming out of a furnace. Do you know uh, men in China and India have learned to walk on white hot coals? Uh, fire, there's a law of nature that where there's fire, there's light, and there's nothing but darkness in hell. Nothing but darkness. It's dark. If you're thinking of a physical kind of fire, the kind you're not, you and I know as natural fire, you can forget that, folks, because there's a fire far, million times, millions of times hotter than that. I want to talk to you about a fire in the bosom of man. Let me read it to you. Can a man take fire in his own bosom without getting burnt? Proverbs 6, 27. Psalms 39, 3. My heart was hot within me while I was musing. The fire in me burned. I lie even among them that are set on fire. Psalms 57, 4. Proverbs 16, 27. An ungodly man diggeth up evil, and in his lips there's a burning fire. For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. The fire is in the heart. It's in the mind. It's in the conscience. Let me read it to you further. Jealousy is cruel as the grave. The coals thereof are coals of fire. 
which hath a most white hot flame. What is it? Out of the heart, the spirit of jealousy, the coals are coals of fire which give out a white hot flame. A white hot flame where? Not down there, not up there, in here. For wickedness burneth as a raging fire. Wickedness burns as a raging fire. The breath of the Lord is like a stream of brimstone. Isaiah 30, 33. The breath of the Lord is like a stream of brimstone. That doesn't mean that there's actual ash falling. No, he's trying to show something more powerful than that. It's like the hot lava of God's breath. I tell you that I believe that hell is ignited here on earth. Every sinner ignites the spark of hell before he ever gets there. Behold, all ye who kindle a fire that surround yourself with sparks, walk in the light of your fire and in the sparks that you've ignited, but you shall lay down in sorrow. When you lay down in wickedness, the fire is a spark that you ignited by your own wickedness. God looked down on the wicked and he said, These wicked are smoke in my nostrils. They are as a fire that burneth all the day long. God looks down right now and he sees the fires of hell burning. He sees it burning in the hearts and minds of men everywhere right now in this auditorium. Jesus said, The fire is in the tongue even. The tongue, James said this, The tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. It defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. Did you hear that? James said the fire of hell is in your heart and comes out your tongue. What you speak, your confession, that you've denied the Son of God, your wickedness. God's not sending you to hell. You're sending yourself to hell. You're walking in it right now. He that believeth not is already damned. Jesus warned that hell is a place where the worm never dies and the fire never goes out or unquenchable. Now, what does that mean? What is the worm that never dies? Folks, the worm is the memory. It's the conscience. The torment of hell is the constant replay of every lost opportunity. Even the devil and the beast and the false prophet are going to be tormented by this worm. And the devil was cast in the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. And they shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Even the devil's going to be tormented. The lake of fire. Folks, have you ever wondered what the Bible means? A lake of fire? Abraham was promised a seed like the sands of the sea. The sea. Jude said the wicked are raging waves of the sea or the lake, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Do you know what that is? That's a sea of damned humanity. That's a sea. That's a lake of lost people. That's a lake that's burning. There's a fire inside of each one of them. It's a lake of fire. The seed of Abraham was as the sea. The prophet here, Jude, says they're raging waves of the sea. You see, that's hell, these raging waves. This lake of raging people with the fire burning in their bosom. What did Abraham say to the rich man who called out of hell to him? Abraham said to him, Son, remember that you in your lifetime received good things and Lazarus the evil things. But now he is comforted and now you are tormented. All right. What was the torment Abraham is describing? Remember. Remember all that you had. Remember your lost opportunities. Remember you had plenty of chances and Lazarus didn't. What was the torment Abraham is describing? Your remembrance. I call it instant replay. Now, folks, I want to get heart to heart with you now. I hear people say, well, I believe that, David, all the hell you get the hell on earth right here. I'm in hell. Have you ever heard anybody say, I'm in hell? No, you haven't been to hell until you stand 
before the great white throne of Christ. Jesus is the judge, not the Father. The Father judges no man, but has given all the judgment to the Son. Jesus Christ is the judge. You've not been to hell until the book is open. And I know what's in that book. I used to think it'd go like this. Well, you committed adultery on January 15th, April the 7th. You cursed God's name uh, 55 times. Here you cheated your income tax and all the ugly, filthy deeds of the flesh. That's not what's in the book, folks. The book's going to be open and you're going to be judged. It's going to be something like this. January the 7th, you were watching television. You heard an evangelist, Jimmy Robinson, Billy Graham. You turned it down. On this day, you went to church with your wife or family. You turned me down here. This day, you were driving to work, feeling depressed. The Holy Spirit was sent to you, said you need Christ. You rejected it. You rejected your friend's call here, 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 here. And all the opportunities, all the opportunities you've had, those, you see, the only sin that really damns you, the real damning sin, is your rejection of the love of Jesus Christ. I can't bring myself to believe that God is just concerned about uh, whether you uh, smoke or drink. Those things are damnable, yes. But the thing that sends you to hell is the fact that Jesus stretched out his arms and loved you and called you and called you. He said, I called you and I called you and I called you. You said, no, here, no, here, no, here. You kept saying no to me. You haven't been to hell till you face that. And before you go to hell bound hand and foot, the Holy Ghost is going to implant those opportunities so strong in your mind. That's when the fire begins. Never dies. That's the worm that doesn't die. That worm is going to turn. You haven't been to hell until you're bound hand and foot and face that gapping hole called the abyss called outer darkness. You haven't been to hell till you drift further and further and further away from the presence of God. Until finally face to face with the devil. The Antichrist on one side and the beast on the other. And he clays, lays claim to your soul. Now folks, let me tell you what I believe it's going to be like. I, I don't believe, first of all, that God gets any pleasure out of the death of the wicked. The Bible said he gets no pleasure out of the death of the wicked. Some people think that God's going to stand on the, sit on the throne all through eternity getting glee. And getting a thrill out of people uh, tormented through hell. Oh, no, no, no. People are going to be tormented because of the memory of the love of God. The love of Jesus Christ and all the lost opportunities. It's going to, it saddens the heart of God. It grieves Him. God's not against any sinner. His love reaches out. And I'm preaching hell, but I'm preaching it to you in love. That's just what Jesus wants. But folks, here's what I believe it's like. Here's a husband from Fort Worth, Texas. A husband that's here tonight, no doubt. He's going to walk out on me because he's going to say some other time, I felt nothing. He's hardened his heart. He's heard Billy Graham. He's heard James Robinson. He's heard Rex Humbard. He's heard them all. Man, he's been saturated with the gospel. He's had time after time. His wife's talked to him. His friends have talked to him. He's going to walk out on me tonight. But one of these days, my brother... You're going to stand face to face with the devil. And you're going to be in hell. And I don't look for you to be in some kind of hot lava with a stench of flesh. No, that's not hot enough. I'm going to tell you about a fire that terrifies my soul. I hate to even talk about it. It's so frightening, even to my heart. As many times as I've talked about him. He's in hell. He sees Satan. All the dregs of humanity, all the perversions, all the filth, all the ugliness of the damned. He stands there and said, oh, I'm lost. I'm lost, I'm damned, I'm in hell. And suddenly the worm begins to turn. I called instant replay. He's feeling the agony of being damned. He's feeling the agony. I'm lost. I'm doomed forever. There was a hell after all. And suddenly the worm turns in his conscience. And suddenly the fire begins to burn. And suddenly in his mind the lights go on. And he's back in this auditorium. And he's sitting right in his same seat. And he looks around. And Mr. Wilkinson's right on stage. Everything's in its place. The lights are on. And he breathes a sigh of release. He pinches himself. He said, oh, my, I don't know what happened. Somebody must have slipped something into it. something I drank. I've had a nightmare. I must have had one of those out-of-the-body experiences. I dreamed that I stood before Christ, and I was in hell. I saw the face of the devil. 
Oh, thank God. Lord, you don't have to tell me anymore. You don't ever have to call me again. And I'm preaching the same sermon. He can't wait now for me to quit. He said, Mr. Wilkinson, please give that invitation. And he fills the pool. And he gets up and he walks down now and he's running now. He, yes, Jesus, I'm coming. I'm coming. I've had a dream. I've been scared this time. The fear of the Lord's the beginning of wisdom, and I'm coming right now. He comes down. He stands there. He's surrounded by people, the same people who came that night that he rejected. They're all there. He said, oh, I must have dreamed it. I'm still with the crowd of believers. I've made my decision. Jesus, here I am. He's about to feel the flood of peace come into his heart. He's about to feel the, the warmth of the Holy Spirit, and suddenly the picture goes black. It's gone. And he wakes up and he says, it wasn't a dream. It wasn't a nightmare. I'm in hell. Suddenly the worm turns. And all around him people are going through it. Screaming, gnashing their teeth. This waging waves, this lake of fire that's burning in the hearts of men. They're all remembering. They're cursing God. Don't allow it anymore. I've had enough cursing his face. And suddenly the lights go on again. And here he is in his living room now. His wife is there bringing in a cup of coffee. And the little boy is playing with his truck. And Billy Graham's on one of his specials. And he says, honey, come here quick. I think I'm losing my mind. I keep floating in and out of the body. I thought I was in hell. I saw the devil. I felt the lostness. I felt the damning of my soul. And he pinched me. Tell me I'm alive. Jesus settled down, honey. Everything's all right. See, the fire is burning. This is torment. This is torment. Because now he's back in the flesh. And he said, honey, please... Let's get underneath right here now. We've heard him say it so many times. Come on. There is a hell, honey. Come on. Let's pray. And he said, Jesus, come in. I want to be saved. Thank you, Jesus. And it breaks down and it goes back again. So, God, how long do I have to put up with that in and out, back and forth, heaven and hell, life and death? I'm lost. My wife is gone. My child is gone. I'm in hell. Can you imagine? Folks, I tremble. You talk to me about some kind of fire out of a furnace. That doesn't scare me at all. What frightens me, my brother, sister, what puts the almighty fear of God in my heart is that I should go through eternity reliving crusades like this, reliving opportunities and calls, reliving every Bible verse I'd ever heard. And all through eternity have the face of some Christian friend appearing here, here, everywhere, saying, Come on, John, Jesus loves you. Come on, John, get saved. Come on, John, here's the scripture. And all through eternity, he says, Get away, don't, sir. He reaches out to smash that face with his fist. Get out of my sight. That face keeps coming up all through eternity. Every Christian friend, every Bible verse that rings through his ears and his heart. hell. It shocks me beyond words that we lost our fear of God. I preached the love of Jesus too. I preached it all my life. But folks, we've preached it so much that we've got a pablum God now who has no wrath in him. We have allowed and justified sin and every kind of corruption in our lives. And we picture that when we get to God, he's going to be so loving, he's just going to wipe it all out and let you go scot-free. Now, folks, I don't believe in scaring people to heaven because it doesn't work if you just get scared. And I learned my lesson the hard way. When I, I used to love to preach funerals because I got people scared to start with. And I got more people saved in my funerals than a lot of people did in their crusades. And I, I remember when my wife's grandfather died. He's in his 80s. Grandpa Morgan, great man of God. And he told all of his children, grandchildren, nephews and nieces, 
You'll never get away from the power of my prayers even when I'm dead and gone. My prayers will get you. And I knew he'd said that. And they asked me to preach the funeral, and I just got out of Bible school, boy. And my wife's brothers and family, I, I was only 115 pounds, and they used to call me the screeching deacon and skinny and everything. And I thought, boy, I got them now. Those were days of the open casket, and I'm up on stage, and there's Grandpa's body laying there, and I look out, and there's the family. Boy, and I started preaching hellfire and brimstone. They started sliding down in their suits. And I said, boy, they're low enough. I'm going to do it now. And I lowered the boom. I said, now, I've given you an invitation, and you better get up and come and kneel at Grandpa's casket or Grandpa's going to get up right now, point a bony finger in your face, say, come on, right now, I told you wouldn't get away. Pandemonium broke out. Boy, did they come running. They could, they could just see Grandpa getting up saying, come on, David, come on, Ray, come on. I, I mean, they were weeping and wailing, and I stood up there, boy, I'm getting them all saved. The next day, they wouldn't talk to me. They were all mad didn't do a thing. I'd scared them. And I said, never again. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm trying to paint what I believe is a vivid picture of hell. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. Now, folks, you and I had better get a hold of God tonight. Some of you people are not living where you should at all. You know it. Some of you have been flirting with sin so long. Some of you have just been so far from the Lord. I'm asking you to open your heart tonight. I'm asking you to say, Jesus, I feel your love. I know you don't want me to be damned. You came to seek me. You came to save me. That's the beautiful thing. Even though there's wrath in God, his love is greater than his wrath. Hallelujah. I'm going to ask you tonight. To be honest, before I close, are you ready? Come on. Is there open, flaunted sin in your life? Are you playing games? Do you keep saying, Lord, you know my heart. One of these days I'm going to come. One of these days I'm coming all the way back. Are you sitting here right now having to admit, David, I've left my first love. I used to have his fire in my soul. Oh, I loved him. The word was real to me, but something's happened to me. I'm drifting away from my first love. God said, I've got something against you because you left your first love. So repent. Remember how it was. Go back and do it all over again. I want tonight to ask you to come back to his arms. Come back to his love tonight. God forbid that you should hear a sermon like this. You should hear a message like this. Then get up and walk out. And say, well, I'll take my chances. I can't imagine anybody doing that. I can't imagine anybody sitting through a meeting like this, hearing the word of God. Now, I gave you a scripture. I didn't preach David Wilkerson. I preached God. I preached Jesus Christ. I preached through the anointing of the Holy Spirit tonight. And I don't think there's any more the Holy Ghost can do tonight. But come down and tug and pull at your heart and say, this message is for you. Flee from the wrath of God. Flee from it. Run from it. Run to the arms of Jesus. You can be protected. He says, come on, I'll take you into my arm as a mother hen gathers the little chicks. Come on, come on, get into the ark of safety. Come on, get under my wing. The storm is coming. The end is coming. All hell's going to be let loose. Come on, get under my wings. It won't touch you. I'm going to keep you. I'm going to protect you. Come on, get in. Folks, you better get in soon because the time is drifting away. Slipping right through our fingers. I want everybody in the building to stand quietly. Not a sound being made, please. Not a sound. All right, look this way, please. Do you believe the Holy Spirit's in this room? I do. I believe His Holy Spirit's here, and you can't come to Jesus except the Holy Spirit draws you. And I'm going to ask Him to draw you. That's what I call the pull, the tug. You feel that pull, that tug. Dallas and praise are coming to sing, come unto Jesus. 
And when they're singing that, and even while I'm pr praying tonight, I want you to get out of your seat, up in the balcony, go to either side, and come down the steps. You that are lined against the wall, and in the back wall, and here on the main floor, I want you to come up this side, and I want you to come up this side over here, and I want you to stand. Pull the curtain open there, if you will, please. And I want you to stand behind me. We're going to have what I call the miracle afterglow service. I need 10 minutes with you. I can say some things to you privately I can't say publicly. And I'm going to have it out with you, and I'm going to pray for a miracle in your life. Some of you need it in your marriage, in your home, and in your life. Young people, married couples, hand in hand, dad and mother, grandpas, grandmothers. Now, folks, I don't count numbers anymore. That doesn't mean anything because I've got nothing left to prove. I've had all the honors a man can stand. All I'm interested in, I'm on a life and death mission right now to turn you away from sin, to turn you away from sin and to God. That's the only purpose of this meeting tonight. See, so many times, these meetings don't mean anything. It's just getting a, bunch, a group of people together, and, and we just walk out getting a little bit blessed. God forbid that that should happen tonight. There's got to be a purpose to a meeting like this. It's just a waste of time. You've got to have a moment of honesty while I pray and say, Jesus, are you talking to me? Have I become a phony? Or I'm one of those 95 percenters. Have I been holding back? Have I been losing my first love? Am I really ready? Have I been running from God? Have I put it off long enough? You feel that tug just as I pray. And the moment I pray, you get out of your seat. Come with a friend if you have to. Wherever you're at, this way and face me. Just turn facing me back there. We're going to have our miracle afterglow service right there. No counselors, please. Just those who have a hunger. Those who say, David, accept his love. I'm going to run from his wrath into his arms.